everyone and welcome to our service this morning take my mask off they're waving at me at the back and good morning if you're uh, watching on youtube as well so it's wonderful to be here this morning and to um look forward to steve uh unpacking the genealogy from matthew for us this morning it's going to be great um it is the fourth week of advent uh, so today we have our carol service this evening at seven o'clock um, and then next week we have services Christmas Eve 3.30 till 4, uh, 3.30 for craft, 4 o'clock for the crib service and then midnight it starts at 11 and then the Christmas Day service is at 10 o'clock. But then we have another one on Sunday at 10.30 on the 26th um, and the same on the 2nd, there'll just be one service each of those Sundays. So lots to uh, get involved in. It's obviously a little bit uncertain at the moment. You may have, uh, you know, keep half an eye on the news and whatever. And if anything changes, then what we'd hope to do is to uh, record the services in some way and still make them available. So um, if, we, if we do have to change anything, then there will still be a Christmas from Christchurch. Don't, don't worry about that. Okay. Um, so let's start with a prayer, um, and then we will, I'll invite Chris, who's with us today, if he could come and light the Advent candles as we start our service. So let's just wait in God's presence, as he welcomes us into his presence. And we say thank you, Lord, for Christmas. Thank you the gift of faith and thank you for the gift of worship that we can come before you and offer our sacrifice of praise to you. We thank you that you sent your son and we pray that our time together will glorify you and we pray that we will have a real sense of your presence with us and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So if we can invite Chris forward. Oh, my shaky hands. And you can just light the four uh, red candles for me. So during Advent, we light a new candle each week. And we light the fourth candle uh, to remind us of the Advent hope that Jesus is coming again. Matthew 24, 24 says, So you also must be ready, because the Son of Man will come at an hour when you do not expect him. Almighty God, as your kingdom dawns, turn us from the darkness of sin to the light of holiness, that we may be ready to meet you in our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Chris. And now we come to our time of confession before I invite the band to lead us in our first song. So that should come up on the screen up above you. 
So we say this together. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we have sinned against you and against our neighbour in thought and word and deed. Word and deed. Through negligence, through weakness, through our own deliberate fault, we are truly sorry and repent of all our sins. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, who died for us, forgive us all that is past and grant that we may serve you in newness of life to the glory of your name. Amen. For all those who truly repent and turn away from their sins, our Lord Jesus offers us forgiveness through his death on the cross. Let us receive that forgiveness today. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So let me invite the band to lead us in our first song. Would you like to stand with us for this song? O come, Emmanuel. O come, Emmanuel. Rejoice, Emmanuel, shall 
please take your seats as I uh, invite Julia to come and bring us our reading. The reading is taken from Matthew chapter 1, beginning to read at verse 1, and is the genealogy of Jesus. A record of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham was the father of Isaac, Isaac the father of Jacob, Jacob the father of Judah and his brothers, Judah the father of Perez and Zerah, whose mother was Tamar, Perez the father of Hezron, Hezron the father of Ram, Ram the father of Amin Aminadab, Aminadab the father of Nas Nashon, Nashon the father of Salmon, Salmon the father of Boaz, whose mother was Rahab, Boaz the father of Obed, whose mother was Ruth, Obed the father of Jesse, and Jesse the father of King David. David was the father of Solomon, whose mother had been Uriah's wife. Solomon, the father of Rehoboam, Rehoboam, the father of Abijah, Abijah, the father of Asa, Asa, the father of Jehoshaphat, Jehoshaphat, the father of Jehoram, Jehoram, the father of Uzziah, Uzziah, the father of Jotham, Jotham, the father of Ahaz, Ahaz, the father of Hezekiah, Hezekiah, the father of Manasseh, Manasseh, the father of Amon, Amon, the father of Josiah, and Josiah, the father of Jeconiah, and his brothers at the time of the exile to Babylon. After the exile to Babylon, Jeconiah was the father of Shealtiel, Shealtiel, the father of Zerubbabel, Zerubbabel, the father of Abiad, Abiad, the father of Eliakim, Eliakim, the father of Azor, Azor, the father of Zadok, Zadok, the father of Achim, Achim, the father of Eliad, Eliad, the father of Eleazar, Eleazar, the father of Mathan, Mathan, the father of Jacob, and Jacob, the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom was born Jesus, who is called Christ. Thus, there were 14 generations in all, from Abraham to David, 14 from David to the exile to Babylon, and 14 from the exile to the Christ. This is the word of the Lord. Right, I hope you've all remembered that, because I'm going to ask you questions. <laughs> the manager of a large office noticed a new employee and asked, what's your name? The worker replied, John. The manager scowled and said, look, I don't know where you've worked before, but I don't call anybody by their first name. It breeds familiarity, and that leads to a breakdown in authority. I refer to my employees by their last name only, Smith, Jones, Baker, whatever it is, and I'm to be referred to as Mr. Robertson. Now we've got that straightened out, what's your last name? The new guy sighed, Darling, my name is John Darling. To which the boss replied, nice to meet you, John. <laughs> Names are important when it comes to uh, especially when it comes to the names in your family tree. And tracing one's family pedigree is regarded by many in societies as enormously important in providing a sense of identity. Genealogies were often memorised because ancient people didn't have access to written records. And even today, it's not uncommon for a Bedouin Arab to be able to recite a list of their ancestors for an hour without making any mistakes. Evidence from family lines was used to decide inheritance rights, to make land allotments, and to organize censuses. Hence why Luke 2 verse 3 says that everyone went to his own town to register. Joseph could trace his heritage from David, and he knew that his family was from Bethlehem, the city of David. And the only way to be sure of your ancestral hometown was to know 
your own family tree. And the Bible contains numerous lists of, of genealogies. The book of Genesis alone has nine different genealogies. One Chronicles has 17 chapters devoted to family trees. And Ezra 2 speaks of some of the returning exiles who searched for their family records but couldn't find them and so were excluded from the priesthood. These family records were held in the public records office and Herod the Great, the king at the time of Jesus' birth, was so embarrassed that as a half Jew and half Edomite, his name wasn't in the official genealogies, he ordered their destruction so that nobody could claim a purer pedigree than his own. The family line of Jesus was essential to establish because his enemies enjoyed making disparaging remarks about him in an attempt to discredit his standing in the community. Matthew 13, coming to his hometown, he began teaching the people in their synagogue and they were amazed. Where did this man get his wisdom and these miraculous powers, they asked? Isn't this the carpenter's son? Isn't his mother's name Mary? And aren't his brothers James, Joseph, Simon and Judas? Aren't all his sisters with us? Where then did this man get all these things? And they took offence at him. And in John 7.42 they asked, does not the scriptures say that Christ will come from David's family and from Bethlehem, the town where David lived? If you've ever researched your own genealogy, you've probably discovered some darlings along with some real disasters. And that's the case even in Jesus' genealogy. There are some darlings in his family tree, along with some real disasters. But they all show us who Jesus really is, giving us hope in the midst of our own disasters. A record of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Matthew begins with a long list of hard-to-pronounce names, and you did an excellent job, Julia. But you would think that he would begin the exciting news of the long-awaited Messiah's birth with a bit more of a bang. It's a bit like the man who asked to make a review of the phone book, wrote, great cast of characters, weak plot. Any first century Jew would find this family tree both impressive and compelling. Most Jews telling the story of Israel's ancestry would begin with Abraham. But only a select few by the first century AD would be able to trace their own line through King David. Even fewer would be able to continue by going on through Solomon and the other kings of Judah all the way to the exile. After the exile, Israel hadn't had a functioning monarchy. The kings and queens they had had in the last 200 years before the birth of Jesus, including the current King Herod, were not from David's family. But Matthew gives the historical facts that prove that Jesus is indeed descended from the line of true and ancient kings. And as though, as, and as though to emphasize that Jesus isn't just simply one member of an ongoing family, but actually the goal of the whole list, he arranges the tree into six groups of seven names. The number seven was and is one of the most powerful symbolic numbers. And to be born at the beginning of the seventh seven in the sequence is clearly to be the climax of the whole list. This birth then, Matthew is saying, is what Israel has been waiting for for 2,000 years. This is both the fulfillment of two millennia of God's promises and purposes and something quite new and certainly something very different. By starting with Jesus' family tree, Matthew emphasises to his predominantly Jewish readership Jesus' human heritage in verses 1 to 17, and then a bit later, his holy heritage in verses 18 to 25. And he makes four powerful opening statements about the subject of his gospel. His name is Jesus, the Saviour. 
the angel who appeared to Joseph in a dream in Matthew 1, 21 declares, she, Mary, will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. His title is Christ, meaning the Anointed One. In Hebrew, the word is Messiah. Jesus is the one everyone was waiting for. He's the son of David. David is listed before Abraham, even though Abraham came first in history. Because Matthew is establishing that first and foremost, Jesus is a direct descendant of David, and therefore qualified to be the eternal king. In Matthew 22, Jesus asked his enemies the question, what do you think about the Christ? Whose son is he? The son of David, they replied. He is the son of Abraham, which means that Jesus was Jewish, and like Abraham who suffered, he is the supreme servant. Abraham was promised that through his bloodline would come forth someone who would bless all nations. The lineage of the Lord is traced back to Abraham. And at the same time, Jesus said in John 8, 58, that he is eternal. Before Abraham was born, I am. A very prominent family commissioned a professional biographer to record their family tree. And they gave him very careful instructions and cautioned him to deal very carefully with a certain Uncle George, who, in a drunken stupor, had committed murder and was subsequently sent to the electric chair. The biographer assured them that he could handle it. And this is what he wrote. Uncle George occupied a chair of applied electronics at an important government institution. He was attached to his position by the strongest of ties, and his death came as a real shock. <laughs> the Messiah comes from a line of people that most of us would want nothing to do with. These people who we would call failures are in Jesus' family line, not for what they have in common with Jesus, but for what they share in common with each one of us. We are like them in so many ways. And we've been discovering this in our series on being human in a God-shaped world, as we've been looking at a number of the Old Testament characters, their virtues and their flaws. But isn't that why Jesus came? Jesus takes our failures and he turns them into something fruitful. Everything that's happened in the past, that takes place today, and what is yet to come, is part of his glorious and grand plan. As we look back at that lineage of Jesus and the stories of those we've been studying in our series, we can see God weaving in and out as he makes his way through the faithful, the failures, and the forgotten in order to accomplish his purposes of bringing salvation to the world. One writer said it this way, this genealogy is marked by gross sin, blatant idolatry, captivity in Egypt, captivity in Babylon, a succession of flawed kings and hostile enemies, yet God's plan is carried out to completion. It's as if God is saying, the famine in Egypt couldn't starve my plan. 400 years of slavery in Egypt and another 70 in Babylon couldn't shackle my plan. Murder, corruption and idolatry could not stop my plan. And remember too that the Bible teaches that history is moving forward towards a point of conclusion. At some definite point in the future, God will send his son to this earth, to this earth a second time as the triumphant king. Are you and I ready for that? The good news of this genealogy is the grace of God. Jesus' relatives could have been sweet and clean living like the TV's Waltons family. Instead, they're more like the Mitchells from EastEnders. But God loves to give grace to the Uncle Georges of life. 
Jesus came not to redeem those who think they're righteous, but to save sinners. Rick Warren said, the worse you are, the better candidate you are for the grace of God. The glory of God's grace extends to the faithful, the failures, and the forgotten, because grace flows through the branches and twigs of this Christmas tree. So let's start with some of the darlings in Jesus' genealogy. David and Abraham. God promised to bless the world through Abraham's seed, and in the midst of disappointment, God promised that David's seed would rule the world forever. Thus, Jesus is the king, whose rule brings blessing to all who welcome him as their king. After centuries of anticipation, then, these opening lines of the New Testament invite us to receive Jesus as our rightful king, to welcome Jesus as our sovereign Lord, and to accept his rule over our lives. As well as people like Abraham and David, we have other darlings, such as Uzziah and Hezekiah, great reformers of their day. These are the kind of people one would expect to see in Jesus' genealogy. On the other hand, though, there are some we would not expect to see, some real disasters. Also, surprisingly, unlike most royal genealogies, God includes four women in Jesus' genealogy. William Barclay, in his commentary on Matthew, says, it is not normal to find the names of women in Jewish pedigrees at all. Women had no legal rights. A woman was regarded not as a person, but as a thing. She was merely the possession of her father and of her husband, and therefore his to do with as he liked. In the regular form of morning prayer, the Jew thanked God they had not made him a Gentile, a slave, or a woman. So the very existence of these names in any pedigree at all is a most surprising and extraordinary phenomenon. So including women in your genealogy just wasn't done in Jesus' day. But if you are going to include them, you might at least include the more noble women. But that's not what God does in Jesus' genealogy. He includes some of the most ignoble women in Jewish history. First you have Tamar, She seduces her father-in-law to have sex with her so that she can have a child. There's Rahab, a Gentile prostitute who sold her body at Jericho's city wall every night, but she did provide protection to the Jewish spies. Then there's the wife of Uriah. What she did was so shameful that the genealogy doesn't even mention her name, but everyone knew it was Bathsheba. She seduces King David into committing adultery with her. He kills her husband to cover up the sin when she becomes pregnant. Of all the women in Jesus' genealogy, why include these? Why treat these sinners and dignify them by putting them in Jesus' family tree? It's because Jesus came to save sinners to turn them into saints, to dignify them by his association with them. Matthew 1, 21, he will save his people from their sins. Then in Matthew 9, 13, Jesus himself declares, I came not to call the righteous, but sinners. And he'll do the same for you and I if we let him. Just trust him with your life and answer his call to follow him. Unlike all the other rabbis in Jesus' day who wanted only the best and the most devout people to follow them, Jesus chose to call out the sinner to follow him. That included Matthew, possibly the author of this gospel, who was the worst of sinners in Jewish society. He was a tax collector for the Roman government, a traitor to the Jews, cheating them out of their money to get rich at their expense. Yet, at Jesus' call, He left it all to follow Jesus. Martin Luther, the great 16th century reformer, said, Christ is the kind of person who's not ashamed of sinners. In fact, he even puts them in his family tree. As one reads through Jesus' genealogy, it follows pretty much the same formula throughout. 
name one was the father of name two, and name two was the father of name three, and so on. But when you get to the end of the genealogy, the formula changes. Verse 16. And Jacob, the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom was born Jesus, who is called Christ. Joseph is not listed as Jesus' father. He's listed as Mary's husband. Because, of course, Jesus was not Jesus' father. God is. And if we just go forward a verse from the end of our reading, verse 18, it makes this very clear. This is how the birth of Jesus Christ came about. His mother Mary was pledged to Joseph, but before they came together, she was found to be with child through the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit caused Mary to be with child, not Joseph. So Jesus is, is the Son of God. He is God in the flesh, John 1, 14. God's only Son, John 3, 16. And the great I Am, John 8, 58. Jesus taking on the same name with which God introduced himself to Moses in Exodus 3. Bono, the lead singer of the rock group U2, was asked if he thought the claim of Jesus' divinity was far-fetched. He answered, no, it's not far-fetched to me. Look, the secular response to the Christ story always goes like this. He was a great prophet, obviously a very interesting guy, had a lot to say alongside other great prophets such as Elijah, Muhammad, Buddha or Confucius. But actually, Christ doesn't allow you to say that. He doesn't let you off the hook. Christ says, I am the Messiah. I am God incarnate. And people say, no, no, please, just be a prophet. A prophet we can accept Otherwise, we're going to have to crucify you. So what you're left with is either Christ was who he said he was, the Messiah, or a complete nutcase. I mean, we're talking nutcase on the level of Charles Manson. This man was strapping himself to a bomb and had King of Jews written on his head. The idea that the entire course of civilization could have its fate changed and turned upside down by a nutcase, for me, Bono says, that's far-fetched. To say that Jesus was just another prophet is as about as far-fetched as you can get. No, he says, Jesus is who he claimed to be, God in the flesh. Matthew records Israel's rise to greatness from Abraham to David. David and Solomon, his successor, brought Israel to the height of their power and glory. In the second section, Matthew records Israel's fall to shame, tragedy and disaster from David to their exile in Babylon, the lowest point in their history. And in the third section, Matthew records Israel's rise again to the hope of restoration in their Messiah, Jesus Christ. So from the shame of their past, Matthew is inviting his Jewish readers to put their hope in Christ, to have the confidence that Jesus will restore them to a place beyond their former glory. And that is his invitation to you and I today, to put our hope in Christ who can redeem our past, to put our hope in Christ who can restore us from the depths of our fall. In his book, The Faith, Chuck, Chuck Colson describes the invasion of Normandy on D-Day, the largest seaborne landing in history. Hundreds of thousands of Allied troops were committed to the initial invasion, employing thousands of vessels, landing craft, and airplanes. The invasion was so massive and successful that it allowed the Allies to turn every German counterattack into another victory. Colson writes, as if preordained, the outcome was clear. The evils of Hitler and fascism would be conquered. And he then goes on to compare the invasion of Normandy with the invasion of God on Christmas Day. He writes, In one sense, the great invasions of history are analogous to the way in which God, in the great cosmic struggle between good and evil, chose to deal with Satan's rule over the earth. He invaded 
but not with massive logistical support and huge armies, rather in a way that confounded and perplexed the wisdom of humanity. It was a quiet invasion. Most of the people in Palestine at the time of Jesus' birth were expecting a messianic invasion like we saw at D-Day. Conquerors in armour, bringing a sword to set the people free from oppression. He carries on, but God came through a virgin on a silent night in Bethlehem, where only some animals and Joseph witnessed. His entrance into the world as a tiny little baby But even so, that invasion has profoundly affected the world about Satan's defeat when Christ disarmed him on the cross. The outcome was clear on that first Christmas day. Evil would be conquered. And that's the hope of Christmas. That's the hope of being a human in a God-shaped world where he, and not us, is in charge and where, thankfully, he makes the calls. God will restore this sin-cursed world and God will restore us if we let him. Just don't lose your hope in him. This Christmas, receive Jesus as your rightful king. Rely on Jesus as your gracious king. Revere Jesus as your divine king. And hope in Jesus as your restoring king. Jesus Christ, the long-awaited and prophesied Messiah, has come. God's plan has been fulfilled. And very soon, the fully God-shaped world will become a reality. Thank you, Steve. I'm going to put this uh, sermon series together. The preachers were asked to choose their passages. And I thought, no one's going to choose that one. I'm very glad that you did, Steve. Thank you. Thank you. Let's pray. We pray to the Father, through the Son, in the power of the Holy Spirit. As we this evening consider the cloud of witnesses at the carol service, we look to you, Lord Jesus, perfecter of our faith. We thank you for Christmas time, our time to reflect on your good gifts to us that Steve has just pointed to this morning. We thank you for Matthew's genealogy that reminds us that you do not just honour the high and mighty or even the pure and holy, but the everyday human facing everyday things. As we look at the world and as each day begins, we hear of disease, trouble, conflict and war. And there is a heaviness in the air. There seems to be darkness all around. Lord, help us to look at the light. Help us to see your light shine in the darkness. Lord, we look to you and cry out, have mercy on us. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Those that are tired, strengthen. Those that are downhearted, encourage. Those who are sad, bring joy. Those who are ill, heal. Those who are near death, comfort. Those who need hope, instill your eternal hope and those who need you come Lord in your mercy hear our prayer we pray for our government for difficult decisions 
We pray for wisdom and integrity, doing the right thing at the right time for the right reasons. Lord, we pray for them, humbly acknowledging these are not decisions we ourselves would like to make. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, we pray for trouble in our world, our relations with Europe after Brexit, for the island of Ireland, north and south, for the tensions on the Ukrainian border, for other areas of conflict and countries suffering drought and famine. Bring light, O Lord, and build up and strengthen the peacemakers. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, we pray for our community. We give thanks for the positive response to yesterday's live nativity. Thanks for all that made it happen. And also thanks for the lives touched by it. People who unexpectedly found joy and light on a Saturday afternoon. We pray for families all around that this will be a safe, peaceful, joyful, and restful Christmas. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, we pray for our church. So many facing a daily struggle that closes out time for you and your word. Renew us by your spirit and feed us by your word, whatever form that takes. Set our expectations of the work required of us low and our expectations of the wind of your Holy Spirit high to feed us and encourage us, to build us up, blow through our daily devotions and house groups, let 2022 be a year of renewal and refreshment that we might live afresh for you. Lord, we pray for those who do not yet know you, that they may say their yes to you and know the joys of life with Christ. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Merciful Father, Accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. And now, as we gather all our prayers and we say the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Now if I can invite the band to bring us our closing song. And just a reminder that after this service, we have our Chris Stingle, which is a service with the orange and the candles and a lot of mayhem, I'm sure. Yeah. Mm-hmm. 
Blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with us and remain with us always. Amen. Go in peace to love and to serve the Lord. In the name of Christ. Amen. Or stay and come to the Christingle. It's up to you.